Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Continue with the next verse, following the one we did last night, which is somewhat of a continuation. Again, it's Prahlad Maharaj, and again he's praying to the Supreme Lord. And this verse is, uh, it's a universal verse. It's a verse that I think all the devotees in our movement have this deep desire in their heart. And this verse kind of illustrates that deep desire exhibited by Prahlad Maharaj in this beautiful prayer here, because this, sec this section is just the prayers. And this is Prahlad's prayer. So, Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Swasastu Vishvasya Kalopasidatam Dayantu Bhutani Shivam Mitodiya Manascha Badram Bajate Ahoksa Jay Avesya Tam No Matir Apya Kunt Apya Aituki Swavastu Vishwasya Kale Pasiditam Tayan to Bhutani Shivam Mito Dia Manas Chabadram Bajatan Ahoksa Jay Avesyatam no Matir Apya Hai Tuki Translation May there be good fortune throughout the universe. And may all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm by practicing bhakti yoga. For by, accept, for by accepting devotional service, they will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us all engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence, Lord Sri Krishna, and always remain absorbed in thoughts of Him. Please repeat. May there be good fortune throughout the universe. 
and may all envious persons be pacified. May all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm. May all living entities become calm. By practicing bhakti yoga. By practicing bhakti yoga. For by accepting devotional service. They will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence. Lord Sri Krishna, and always remained absorbed in thoughts of Him. This is a quite a long purport, so we'll uh, kind of try to break it up a little bit. The following verse describes the Vaishnava. Vancha kalpa taru bhischa kripa sindhu bhye vishya pitanam bhavani bhyo vaishnava bhyo namaha namaha Just like a desire tree, a Vaishnava can fulfill all the desires of anyone who takes shelter of his lotus feet. Prahlad Maharaj is a typical Vaishnava. He prays not for himself, but for all living entities, the gentle, the envious and the mischievous. He always thought of the welfare of mischievous persons like his father, Hirani Kashipu. Prahlad Maharaj did not ask for anything for himself, rather he prayed for, to the Lord to excuse his demoniac father. This is the attitude of a Vaishnava who always thinks of the welfare of the entire universe. Srimad Bhagavatam and Bhagavad Dharma are meant for persons who are completely free of envy. Paramam nimatsaranam satam. Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj prays in this verse, Kala prasidatam. May all the envious persons be pacified. The material world is full of envious persons, but if one frees himself of envy, he becomes liberal in his social dealings and can think of others' welfare. Anyone who takes up Krishna consciousness and engages himself completely in the service of the Lord cleanses his mind of all envy. Manas chabadram bhajate ahok sajay. Therefore, we should pray to Lord Nishringadev to sit in our hearts. Therefore, we should pray, Bahir Nishimho Ridahe Nishimha. Let Lord Nishringadev sit in the core of my heart, killing all my bad propensities. Let my mind become clean so that I might be peacefully worship the Lord and bring peace to the entire world. Mm. So envy is the what moves the world. People in this world, as Srila Prabhupada explains, that the living entity falls to the material world because of envy of Krishna. They want the position of Krishna, although they're not qualified to take that position. And nor is that position available. <laughs> but people want to be, they want to be two things, the, the controller and the enjoyer. So this is the original sin, I want to control so I can enjoy. Mm -hmm. So because of that, the living entities come in contact, or con come in conflict with Krishna and therefore there's no room for such persons in the spiritual world, so they fall to the material world to try to fulfill that desires of being the controller and the enjoyer. Because if you can control, then you can try to plan out how you want to enjoy. <laughs> that's, these two things are inseparable in material life. So that's how material life goes on. Let me control so I can enjoy. <laughs> If you know those two things, you know how the material world works. <laughs> and therefore, because there are many such persons with the same attitude, there's conflict. So that same conflict that started in the spiritual world is now in the material world amongst the living entities here. So people want to push another person out to gain something, to be better than somebody, to... Uh, to present their own light. In other words, they, you know, they, you know, they see others as com competitors, especially if you have the same occupation. We find that's very common when people have the same occupation. Both are trying to do the same thing, and so there's a competition sometimes, and people can be, become envious of others. 
sometimes we see, I saw there was one situation where in one, this was, a, this was in a book written by one devotee, he was giving an example how there was one very successful man in one company. He was so successful that he was developing all kinds of uh, new and intricate software that was helping make the company more richer and he was becoming getting promotions and making all. But his fellow employers, employees became envious of him and they wanted to tear him down. So they took, for, they took opportunities to go into his office when he wasn't there and uh, destroy his material and steal some of it like that. Because the envious was in himself, because he was getting so much attention, promotion, more money, uh, other employee, employees became envious and they tried to destroy him. And they were successful. They were, and he, they, they were successful and they found reasons to find fault with him and, and that ruined his whole career actually. So uh, this is how the material world works. Sometimes we used to say that in Krishna consciousness sometimes a devotee is very good at cooking and everybody likes how they cook. But some other devotees are not happy because that devotee is a good cook, so they steal the vegetables so he can't cook. <laughs> it's happened before. It's not just a story. <laughs> Welcome to ISKCON. So, yeah, so sometimes we see that in Krishna consciousness that somebody's better, somebody has a position, I want that position, or I don't like the way you, you, uh, are managing your position, I can have that position and do better management than you are. So, uh, yeah, so this is like competition. Somebody's a, a, a good preacher, they become a little unhappy, you know, or somebody's a better, at, you know, somebody's better at something, or somebody's getting more attention from Krishna or from the assembly of devotees, and people become envious of that. And it's just, it's a, it's a feature of the material world that goes on. But uh, it's a kind of a disease. And so here, Prahlad Maharaj is saying, uh, let all envious persons become uh, calm and let them become pacified and let everyone think of the welfare of each other. So this is Krishna consciousness. Uh, a devotee is thinking, what can I do to serve another devotee or I can, how I can serve the ashram, how I can serve the yatra? thinks how to make it better for the devotees, how to make it better for the guests. Thinking always about how to improve in such a way that people will benefit, and not just improve, but how people will benefit from that improvement. So that's a Vaishnava. He doesn't so much worry about himself, he knows he'll get his prasadam, he knows he has his, he can chant japa, he can read the book, he can do whatever he needs to do, but he's, He's not happy completely simply by doing what he's doing. He wants to extend himself by doing some welfare work to others, doing something to benefit others. So he thinks, or she thinks, of ways to serve devotees. And that is Krishna consciousness here. So, and then Prahlad Maharaj says, therefore we should pray to the Lord uh, to whatever bad qualities we have. And he's praying, he's praying to Lord Nishringa, Bahir Nishringho Ridaye Nishringha. That he sits in the heart, let him sit there, and what does he do? As, as it was from the previous verse, he removes those bad qualities, he extracts them by his. As we said yesterday, thunderbolt teeth, thunderbolt nails, Raja Damsta, Raja Bhaja, Raja. Rajanakya, Rajadamstra. Rajanakya, Rajadamstra. So that's the prayer that Prahlad Maharaj teaches us uh, to pray to Lord Nishringadev. So when you have good qualities, you naturally want to share with others the benefits that you have gained in your own progress in Krishna consciousness. And Prabhupada says there are two kinds of devotees those who think only of their own spiritual progress and those who think about the welfare of others. 
So those who think of the welfare of others in their practice of Krishna consciousness is actually, these are the ones that get the mercy of the Lord. Krishna gives mercy to everyone according to how they approach, but also, he's also giving special mercy for those who want to take his message uh, and extend it in the form of being a well-wisher, as Srila Prabhupada used to sign his letters, your ever well-wisher, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And that's how he would sign his letter. In other words, he would indicate, I, you know, whatever, I wish you well in all aspects of life. And I'm here to help you to achieve your success in life. So that's the spiritual master. The spiritual master sees all the devotees as his objects for service. He doesn't consider himself, well, I'm the guru and they're there to serve me. I give a class once in a while and then that's, that's my whole program. No. He thinks, well, these are my, they have come to me by Krishna's mercy and therefore it's my duty to serve them. Actually, they have come to me because of my spiritual master's mercy. Because my spiritual master wants me to preach, Krishna has sent me these persons for me to engage in devotional service. So therefore, as Prabhupada said, I see all of my disciples as representatives of my spiritual master. You have come because of his mercy upon me so I can serve him by serving you. That's Prabhupada's uh, realization. He spoke like that also. So a devotee is always thinking how to benefit others in one way or the other. We can do that in so many different ways, even if it's a small thing, giving prasadam to the devotees, or it's like when I came into the temple today, uh, one devotee ran to open the door for me. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh, that's very nice. It's a small thing, but still, it's, it shows that he, there is a sense of wanting to do some service, want to assist in some way. And that's, a, that's an indication of a good heart, and that's an indication of a, a proper consciousness. This is the mood of a devotee. Should always think, uh, you know, look at the situation and what can I do to uh, add to it, to make it even better. So, devotee always thinks the welfare of others. So, as it goes on, this is a long purport, so we'll continue. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur has given us a very fine purport in this regard. When one offers a prayer to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one always requests some benediction from Him. So, we mentioned that last night. Wherever there's a prayer, there is a request for a benediction. Even pure devotees, nishkam, pray for some benediction. As instructed by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in his Shikshastika, Ayi nanda tunu chikinkaram patitam bam vishyame bhavam buddhavam kripaya tabapada pankaja stita duli sadrisham vichintaya. O son of Maharaj Nanda Krishna, I am your eternal servant, Tur. Yet somehow I've fallen into this ocean of birth and death. And then he prays, please, so he's asking for a benediction, please pick me up from this ocean of death and place me as one of the atoms at your lotus feet. In another prayer, Lord Chaitanya says, Manma janmani janmani ishvare bhavatat bhakti rahoi tuki suye. Life after life, kindly let me have unalloyed love and devotion unto your lotus feet. When Prahlad Maharaj chants Om Namo Bhagavate Nana Singhaya, that was like yesterday's verse, he prays for a benediction from the Lord. But because he is also an exalted Vaishnava, he, he wants nothing for personal sense gratification. The first desire expressed in his prayer is Swastyastu Vishvasya. Let there be good fortune throughout the universe. Prahlad Maharaj thus requested the Lord to be merciful to everyone, including his father, who was a most envious person. According to Chanaka Pandit, there are two types of envious living entities. One is the snake and the other is the man, like Harani Kashipu, who is by nature envious of everyone, even of his father or son. 
Hirani Kashipu was envious of his little son Prahlad, but Prahlad Maharaj asked for a benediction for the benefit of his father. Hirani Kashipu was very envious of devotees, but Prahlad wished that his father and other demons like him would give up their envious nation by the grace of the Lord and stop harassing the devotees. Kalau Pasidatam. The difficulty is that the Kalau the level, envious living entity is rarely pacified. One kind of kala, the snake, can be pacified simply by mantras or by an action of a particular herb. Mantra saudi vasa sarpam kalena nivartate. An envious person cannot be pacified by any means. I just realized I need this. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj prays that all envious persons may undergo a change of heart and think of the welfare of others. Hmm. So it goes on, if the Krishna conscious movement spreads all over the world, and if by grace of Krishna everyone accepts it, the thinking of envious persons will change. So, so here's how to change the kala, the envious persons, into a calm, pacified person. Everyone will think of the benefit of others. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj says, Shivam Mito Diya, in material activities, everyone, this is not an exaggeration, everyone is envious of others, but in Krishna consciousness, no one is envious of anyone else. Anyone thinks of the welfare of others. Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj prays that everyone's mind be become gentle by being fixed at the lotus feet of Krishna. As indicated elsewhere in Srimad Bhagavatam, Savai Mana Krishna Padara Vindaya, and as advised by Lord Krishna in Gita, Manmana Bhava Mad Bhakta, one should constantly think of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, then one's mind will certainly be cleansed. Chaito Dharpana Marjanam. Materialists always think of sense gratification, right? This is the nature of the mind. The mind is always thinking of sense gratification. That is the that is the materialist. But Prahlad Maharaj says, prays that the Lord's mercy will change their mind and they will stop thinking of sense gratification. If they think of Krishna always, everything will be all right. Some person to argue that if everyone thought of Krishna in that way, the whole universe would be vacated because everyone would go back home, back to Godhead. That's terrible. <laughs> However, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says that this is impossible because the living entities are innumerable. If one set of living entity is actually delivered by the Krishna conscious movement, another set will fill up the universe. <laughs> so there's always the fallen souls are always there. <coughs> So, yeah, if you, the principle of love is that you want to share something. If you have, if you see that if you have something that you like a lot and it makes you happy, one of the things you think of is how to share with somebody. And you want to share that happiness that you're experiencing with others. It could be a small thing or it could be something that's very dear to you. But it, in either case, the principle remains the same, that there's a tendency to want to share or give good fortune or give some happiness, show some kindness or do something for another person that you feel has made you happy or has benefited you in some way or another. <laughs> this is uh, how a devotee thinks. So we understand that, well, chanting Hare Krishna is something that we have been experiencing. It's help, helping us to make progress towards Krishna. It gives us, what we say, focus. It helps us to become uh, more and more aware of Krishna. It, it's also very ecstatic when, when we do it together in kirtan. So a devotee feels, well, this is, this is something that I've been given, and it's so wonderful. 
let me share it with somebody else. So we want to, when we meet people, we think how to get them to chant or help them to recognize uh, the beauty of chanting. I remember in our Rathiatra festivals in America, and these are very common. It's one thing the United States of America is very good at in Krishna consciousness having Rathiatra festivals. We have, during the summer months, starting in the first week of June, all the way up to the end of September, every week, uh, somewhere in the United States, there is a major Rathiatra festival. Sometimes two days, sometimes three days, other times just one day. But we take Jagannath out in his carts, big giant, gigantic carts, full-size carts, and we hold big festivals, and people come and uh, sometimes thousands and thousands of people come see Lord Jagannath. We also distribute prasadam. But recently, we, was, we were starting to do what is called mantra meditation programs. And we were setting up booths in our different festivals. Because after the Ratha Yatra, we have a festival with tents and various types of displays, which are educational and very... Uh, enjoyable, plus various types of prasadam programs, huge festivals. We spend thousands and thousands of dollars to put these festivals on. And, every, and so many people come for these festivals. It's one of the features of uh, Prabhupada's preaching is to have Rathiatra all over the world. So many of the major cities have big, big festivals. So one, I remember one year we did one in the, in the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., in America. And we had a Maha Mantra booth where the devotees set up these little packages of, with a book, a set of japa beads, plus some instructions on how to chant. And then we would hold, we would invite people to come in, and then we would have one session after another People would sit and we would tell them and run them through the whole process of chanting. And then we would offer them this little packet of beads and books and instructions for a small donation. And I remember one year, it was the year 2014, and I was there. We did 2,000 sets in just a few hours of people taking these packets. and. That the week before we did 1,200 at the Chicago Rathiantra. So people were getting the opportunities to chant. And then this was, I was just thinking there's no better way to preach than this. You teach people how to chant, give them the instructions, the guidance, encouragement. And uh, so this thing really started to snowball and for many, many years, and still, it's still going on when we can again resume our regular Rathiyatras to have these festivals. And they're the, practically the most powerful forms of preaching in the United States is these Rathiyatra festivals. And we have big, big Jagannath deities, take them out on their carts. And I remember my mother, she came to the 1976 Ratha Yatra in New York. And that was the big one that Srila Prabhupada really pushed because he wanted it. He said, I want to conquer the world by conquering New York City. Because as he said, out of all the cities in the world, this is the most important city. So if I can bring Lord Jagannath down the streets of New York City, I will, you know, I've conquered. <laughs> So we had a wonderful festival and Prabhupada was so happy. Not only did we get uh, a big Rathayatra, but we got the main street in, uh, which is uh, Fifth Avenue, which is considered the main street in New York, huge. It goes for miles, this one street, just one big street, and goes for miles and miles and miles. And it's a wide street, and so we got permission and we had a wonderful festival. Prabhupada was so happy. Oh, he was just glorifying the devotees. We had a, we had a, a crisis during that time where uh, the famous Jayananda Prabhu was building these Rathayatra carts. And so he would work really hard to put these carts together. He had designed the carts and now he was putting, he was actually helping to build the carts too. 
So he would build these cards for, for different Ratha Yatra festivals all over the United States. And uh, so in this particular festival, we were working late to get the cards done for the next day. The next the morning Ratha Yatra was supposed to start at 10 o'clock in the morning down Fifth Avenue. And uh, so we had finished the cards. And then the carts were there, and all of a sudden, a big wind came off the Hudson River, which was right there. It's a big, it's a, it's one of the, it's a, it's a major river that runs right through New York City. And it, it knocked over Balaram's cart, because they had the canopies over, and the cart fell and smashed. It was completely destroyed, completely. And that was late in the evening. And so we had to have that cart ready for the next. So some devotees would say, we'll just have two carts, but that wouldn't have work. So Bajayananda said, no, we're gonna, we're gonna rebuild this cart. But then again, they had to find the parts because some of the parts were, were lost and destroyed. It's a wonderful story. It's practically done in the form of a book. Now, when I was in London, a couple of years ago, one devotee who was there for that whole thing explained the whole story from top to bottom. How the devotees worked from six o'clock at night to the next morning, building that cart through the entire night. <laughs> and by the time it was time for the Ratha Yachar, that cart was finished. It was done. And the parts that we needed, we had unknowingly thrown away after we had finished the regular building of the carts before it got smashed. But some devotees were aware of those parts, found them in the trash, brought them back, and we built that car. It was an amazing story. And Prabhupada was so happy. And I can tell you how Donald Trump became president. <laughs> Nobody knows the real secret how he became president. And the fact is that we, we had no place to build those carts in New York City. And Donald Trump gave us his land to work on it. He did service to Prabhupada. He had some private land that was in the middle of the city, which was a big open area. And he allowed us to use that area, that, that area to build our carts. And that was his Sukriti. And that's what got him into, into office. Otherwise, you know, he would have never made it. <laughs> so Krishna, you know, reciprocated Donald Trump's service. <laughs> so yeah, so that's a side thing. But the point was that um, this, uh, this, the devotees become so happy when we can, when we see like hundreds and thousands, sometimes thousands of people become interested in Krishna consciousness. And this is one thing that you can do here in, in Europe, too, is maybe start Ratha Yatra festivals here. This would be a wonderful form of preaching because it really, really, really pulls in a lot of people. And if people see Lord Jagannath coming down on their cart, there are people who will never come to the temple. There are people who will never take up spiritual life voluntarily. But when they see Lord Jagannath, they, simply by seeing Lord Jagannath, they get a human birth in their next life. That's how auspicious it is. So it's a w wonderful way to uh, give the mercy to the conditioned souls in a very direct way by having these Ratha Yatra festivals. We do them in, pra in some countries in Europe. Uh, I'm forgetting where we've done it. We've done them in Spain. We did it in, of course, in London. They have one every year, a big one. Um, and in other places around the world. One of the biggest one is in Toronto, Canada, which is a two-day festival, which is on the, the longest street of the, of, in the entire uh, world. This street is the longest street in the entire world. It covers more than 100 miles, one street. <laughs> but it runs through two countries, though. <laughs> Same street. And we have this. We have the last part of that street is where we start our Ratha Yatra festival, which is right near the temple. It's a couple of blocks from the temple, and we put three big carts, just like in Jagannath Puri, huge carts, and we go down all the way down to the to the uh, 
to the to the waterfront, and then we take Jagannath across the water on a ferry boat, and we have a big festival on the island. It's a big festival every year. It's one of my favorite festivals. And, and people come, and then we teach them how to chant. We also do yoga programs for teaching people how to do yoga and uh, distributing uh, Prabhupada's books in a big way. We have stage shows, dramas, and various types. So these kind of festival programs really, really attract the general population. And then we can distribute so much, you know, prasadam, harinam, and then many kinds of programs for enlightening people. So this is a good way to preach. I mean, it's a real big way to preach. It takes some money to put it together, but in, in, the, in a united way, it could be a very wonderful way. And Prabhupada said, I want to conquer the world with Ratha Yatra. <laughs> This is a wonderful. So when we, when devotees can do that, because it's such a, that's a grand way to pull, pull in hundreds of people at one time in a big festival, and they all get some mercy. Either, even if they don't do anything, they get to see the Lord. If they take prasadam, that's even better. If they chant, that's even better. If they engage, if they take a book, that's even better. So these are wonderful forms of so a devotee feels really inspired when others take to Krishna consciousness. A devotee is happy to see another devotee make progress. Prabhupada was asked, is there any envy in the spiritual world? Prabhupada said, yes, there is envy in the spiritual world, but it's not like the envy in the material world. The envy in the material world is mean-spirited, means that it's always trying to tear somebody else down or to push yourself above somebody for your own, you know, sense gratification. But Prabhupada explains what is spiritual envy. The gopis, they say, oh, that gopi is serving Krishna so nicely and Krishna is so happy. So let me try to serve Krishna better than that gopi. <laughs> and that way, who's benefited? Krishna. <laughs> so the competition is, is, is not between each other, but between who can serve Krishna better and who wins Krishna. <laughs> and the devotees also. So there's a kind of a competition. We used to do that in book distribution marathons. We would always have like who would be the top book distributor? And there'd be some competition who could sell the most books. But it was always done in a spirit of, well, the more books we sell, the more people benefit, and the more Srila Prabhupada is pleased. So that kind of competition is not mean-spirited, it spreads Krishna consciousness. So that's good. So that may look like enviousness, but it's not, it's actually, um, beneficial for everyone like that. And if you have, if you're in competition with someone and that person wins, you think, he did great, she did great. There's one devotee in uh, London. She's a nice Indian devotee. She's a little elderly. Every year she wins the marathon. <laughs> Can't figure out how she does it. She's like this middle middle aged lady. <laughs> She's about fifty years old, <laughs> and she every year she wins the marathon, and they always give her the top award. She sells the most books during the Christmas marathon. Mm -hmm. One time I was in Mumbai in in uh, Radhagopinath Temple, and they were announcing the book scores for the day, and this was in the middle of the marathon. So there was one girl, her name was Radha, that was her name, Radha. And so they announced the scores for the day. And today, and yesterday, Radha did 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's. <laughs> so in one day, she did 12,000 Bhagavad Gita. One day. And it was in, so how did she do 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's? She went into an, a big corporation, it was like a factory or something. She spoke to the manager 
and, and convinced him that he should take Bhagavad Gita's for each and every one of his employers, employees. So he, he, was, he was really fired up about it, so he bought 12,000 Bhagavad Gita's and then distributed it to each and one of his workers. <laughs> so that's, that's preaching. <laughs> that's preaching <laughs> like that. So yeah, I mean, in Krishna consciousness, the sky's the limit. That means there's no limit. <laughs> there's a, if you do, if you can do like a hundred books in one day, then the next day you can think of I can do a hundred and eight maybe. And then the next day a hundred and twenty. The devotee always thinks big. Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said, I have one problem. I have this one problem. I can't think small. <laughs> That's my problem, he said. I can't think small. <laughs> and that was probably, he had, he had the ideas of changing the whole world into Krishna consciousness. And he made plans to do that. And his plans are there for us to under, try to understand and try to carry out. Prabhupada had designed a whole program for transforming the whole world into Krishna consciousness. It's still there. And so this is, uh, this is a Vaishnava, always thinks how can others benefit, and this is the best way, because if somebody becomes Krishna conscious, as it says here, then they will think of the welfare of each other. They will stop thinking about their own selfish interest. So this is Prahlad Maharaj. He is one of the most uh, selfless persons, because when Lord Nishringadev said to him, after the Prahlad had satisfied the Lord so nicely, the Lord was eager to give Prahlad Maharaj a benediction. The Lord wanted to reciprocate in some way to his pure devotee, Prahlad. And so he offered Prahlad anything he wanted. And Prahlad refused, saying that, my dear Lord, I don't serve you in order to get something. I serve you because, out of love. And so, but the Lord wasn't convinced. He said, no, you must take a benediction from me. Take something. I want to give you something, so make me happy by taking something. <laughs> in other words, the Lord was, the Lord was saying, uh, in my happiness is I want to reciprocate, do something for you, so ask something. <laughs> so Prahlad Maharaj could see that the Lord was not going to give up so, the, so Prahlad Maharaj said, all right, <laughs> if you want me to take something, now let me stay in this material world and preach to all these people who are rascals. And let me give them Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and when the Lord heard that, his heart just melted in love for Prahlad Maharaj. How he was only thinking of the benefit of others. This is. And we see, we see Srila Haridas Thakur, who was Namachari, he was also in that same mood wanting to spread the holy names everywhere. So it says that uh, uh, Haridas Thakur had the spirit of Prahlad Maharaj within him. He carried the spirit of Prahlad Maharaj, compassion towards all living entities. Um, there's a statement that says that if one sees another person happy, they automatically feel happy. And if one sees another person unhappy, they automatically feel unhappy. So in other words, to see yourself, to see yourself within others and to see others within yourself is actually the principle of, of progressive human life. But the material world is everyone thinks of himself and how I can gain and how I can successfully fulfill my desires. And therefore there's always competition. There's always competition. But devotees, they have the understanding that Srila Prabhupada has came, come to make all living entities Krishna conscious. And if I can help him make others Krishna consciousness, how pleased Prabhupada would be. And I want to please Prabhupada, so let me try to help Prabhupada because he came and sacrificed so much for others. So if I can assist him, that will, that will, that will make me happy and Prabhupada will be pleased. 
So devotee thinks like that. This is, we call it preaching, but it's much, preaching is just a small definition. The actual word is, it says, it says here, a devotee is uh, the well-wisher of everyone. He thinks, oh, well, everyone's well-wisher, everyone's happiness. So Prahlad Maharaj is giving us that deep understanding. So this verse is a very unique verse in the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. He's praying, may there be good fortune throughout the universe and may all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm by practicing bhakti yoga, bhakti. For by accepting devotional service, they will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us all engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence Lord Sri Krishna and always remain absorbed in thoughts of Him. So he understands what is the formula, make everyone Krishna consciousness, conscious. <laughs> okay, so we'll stop here. Pallad Maharaj Ki Jai. Do we have any comments or questions? Not tonight? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. When's the next Rathi Yatra? <laughs> <laughs> Hare Krishna, thank you very much for this important points <clears throat> about importance of preaching. Um, <clears throat> Herein, we, we can understand the high consciousness of Prahlad Maharaj, you know, compassionate nature and, you know, well-wisher of all, all envious living beings. Yeah. But in our level of consciousness, we don't possess this kind of, you know, um, compassion or how can, is, isn't that that is, that we act in some way like uh, artificial, because when we go out, we don't, we are not so much compassionate, we don't feel compassion to these other people. We, we see more like, sometimes maybe uh, we are better than them because they don't know, you know, higher knowledge, you know, it's, it's kind of a... Condescending. Yes, it's, it's not exactly as Prabhupada Maharaj probably is feeling. How, how to, what, what should be our attitude or our well, you approach? Can't. We can't artificially adopt that consciousness, but we can do one thing, and that's, we can say that Srila Prabhupada has compassion for all living entities. So if we can assist him in his service of spreading Krishna consciousness, then that would be something that we could, you know, focus on. Uh, Prabhupada wants people to become Krishna conscious, so let me serve Prabhupada by helping him in that way. So we will be more inclined to please Prabhupada than maybe than, than to show compassion. But so that's more or less the focus. And if we do that, after a while we start developing that mood also. Hmm. When Prabhupada was uh, in Mayapur, I think it was Mayapur or Vrindavan, I'm not sure. He was sitting on, standing on top of the building, the temple, and he was looking out. And it was an area where uh, people had thrown their leaf plates after eating. So, you know, people take prasadam on the leaf plate and then they throw it into this pile. So in that area, there were little children running through there trying to find some food. And there were dogs also running there trying to find food. So there was a more like a competition between the kids and the dogs to, to find some particles of food that were left over. When Prabhupada saw that, he was with, I forget, one or two devotees, Prabhupada started to, to cry. And his tears were coming from his eyes. And then he turned, he said, from, now, from today on we will start food, food for Life programs here. We will, we will, we will begin mass pap or prasadam distribution. But Prabhupada was feeling really compassion for these children who were simply fighting with the dogs to get something to eat. 
And when he saw that, he immediately wanted to do something. But it was, it was, his heart was really, you know, saddened to see that. So then he said, we will begin Food for Life. And then so we started this mass prasadam distribution after that. We were cooking kitchri for thousands of people every day and they were coming. So that was Srila Prabhupada, yeah. Many times he showed that kind of compassion and he would not so much try to exhibit it, but sometimes it would come out. His more soft-hearted uh, mood towards others suffering like that. Yeah, yeah so that's, that's how, and then if we practice that, we can develop that mood more. That's Lord Nityananda's mood. <laughs> he is in that mood. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Is there anyone else? Any other questions? Okay. Yes, okay. I have a question regarding to a situation when we try to distribute Krishna conscious in a way of uh, Sankirtan Yagya, but people d don't accept it. Um, you try to um, encourage them, say something nice, but they don't accept. And uh, um, because we're conditioned, still we feel that um, uh, like a little bit disappointed or that they don't take like a uh, valuable things that we want to give them. How to um, deal with this kind of uh, situation? We should um, pray more to Krishna or... Yeah, and keep trying. Because somebody will take. You might say most people might refuse, but somebody will take. And if you sincerely pray, Krishna will send you people who will take. <laughs> we see that sometimes. When a devotee becomes really, really determined to do something, Krishna sends him somebody to preach to, and it's, that person is very receptive. So yeah, that's there. So we can pray, or sometimes we can think, maybe I should have changed my approach. Maybe my approach is not very uh, acceptable to people. Well, let me try approaching them in a different way. Mm -hmm. Like there's one devotee, he's the king of book distribution in, in Iskand practically. His name is Vaisheshika. Mm -hmm. He wrote that book, Our Family Business. It's all about book distribution. So what he would do, he would, he would run up to people with a big smile on his face and welcome them. And open, and offer to sh he shakes hands with them, talks to them for a few minutes about whatever, just to be friendly. Hey, what's your name? Where are you from? And we're out here. We're monks. We're just trying to. We have this, and then he starts introducing the book. But first, he meets them, and he kind of like he's very gregarious, you could say, and very uh, jovial, open. He's a big guy too, <laughs> so that helps. <laughs> and he's very friendly, and so they they like that, and they just listen to him. And, and a lot of times, just because of him, they take the book. <laughs> so everyone has their own approach. When I went out on book distribution, I asked my leader, "What should I do?" You know, what can I do out there? I'm not, because I was always very shy. I would have a hard time talking to people, and I was very closed. And so that leader told me, just make them laugh. <laughs> so I tried that, and it worked. <laughs> so, you know, maybe they thought I was funny, just, just me, it's myself was quite funny, so. But, you know, we and we did that. We were very successful in collecting money and distributing books. 
by using humor as a way to approach people. And we thought of different ways. Humor is a wonderful way to approach people. Uh, of course, maybe a little harder in Slovenia, but in America it's, it works really good because people will do anything to laugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we were very successful in breaking, we call it breaking the ice or getting people's attention through humor like that. You come up with different things to say. So you th you know you have to th you may think what is, what are, what what's my personality? So you there's something about your personality which is you, and you can use that particular quality as a way to reach people. But if you don't like people, then it's no good. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's people who are like that, and they, they think everybody else is just except for them. <laughs> but that doesn't work in Krishna consciousness. <laughs> so some people are shy, and some people are more open, some people are in between. Yeah, try different things. We used to get business cards from businessmen. When a lot of times when we would be out there, they would say, Hey, you guys are really good. If you need a job, here's my business card. I could use you as a salesman. Yeah, we would get, devotees many times would get business cards. You know, you're, you're really good, so uh, I got a job for you. <laughs> We pay good. You know? Really, well, I got at least two or three business cards. <laughs> and uh, the, some devotees got business cards every day, and they were so good. <laughs> so a few people, you know, they open up in different ways like that. You just have to see what works. Okay, so thank you. We can stop here. Oh, another question? Yes, Maharaj is from Avaduta Rai Prabhu, or from um, Facebook audience. Hare Krishna, Jayadvaita Swami gave seminar about food for dead. Some devotees don't like it. What do you think? Food for what? Food for dead. For what? For De dead. Death? death? Yeah, it's written here, food for dead, but in these comments. Uh, so some devotees don't like it, what do you think? I don't know what it means. There's food for life, but there's no food for death. <laughs> Unless you get poison, <laughs> then that's food for death. <laughs> and uh, another question from the same devotees, what joke, jokes did you use in Sanketan? <laughs> you really, you really want to know. I mean, I think Vaduta Rai Prabhu would like to know that all the audience will benefit from. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> well, our approach was a little strong sometimes, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't so much a joke; it was a way of shocking him in, into into laughter. Their laughter was a relief after we shocked them. <laughs> so he would come up to him and say, excuse me, sir, but um, we're going to have to give you a, a citation. A citation is a fine, and we have a badge, so we look official. <laughs> we're going to have to give you a citation because we caught you having too much fun shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Too much fun shopping. And when we say a citation, they would think, oh no, what did I do? And then when we give them the line, they would laugh, and then after they laughed, and then we'd just say, you know, well, we're here for, f and we please give a donation. <laughs> <laughs>
Or we would go to student dormitories and knock on the doors and say, we got you. We're getting complaints. We're going to have to give you guys a citation. You're watching too much television. <laughs> and then they would, they would laugh. I remember I had about eight guys around me one time. I walked into this place, big guys, and I said that. They all started to crack up. They, were, they said, how much you want? $10, $20? You guys are good. Here's, here's $20. i am going to give them $50. You know? <laughs> because if you have a good show in, in America, if you've got a good show, you're in. <laughs> so we put on this show, which was kind of like a shock treatment. <laughs> And uh, yeah, when, and it shocked them, and then they realized it was a joke. When they realized it was a joke, it was kind of like a relief. And when it was a relief, they would laugh. And when they would laugh, they relaxed. And when they relaxed, they give you money. <laughs> so uh, you know, you might say it's a little bit, you know, interesting. <laughs> So we would make people laugh through kind of like little scare tactics at the beginning, but <laughs> it worked. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, we're going to have to give you a citation. We caught you looking at the ugly girls. <laughs> you know, so something like that. So. So, the idea is that people are miserable, and if you make them laugh, you got them. <laughs> and so they're ready for whatever you, you got. So, you know, and mo mostly everybody would give a donation like that. And so we had great success like that. So, um, it's still going on, <laughs> but it's not as popular as it used to be. <laughs> so, yeah. Because when a person laughs, they're relaxed, they're open. Mm -hmm. That's why we use humor in, in giving classes, because there's devotees that know how to use humor in classes when you give classes. Because as soon as you make people laugh, Right then, their attention is fixed. And then the next line you say, surrender to Krishna. <laughs> Nobody's listening to your class until you finally make them laugh. Then they finally listen. Then their attention is there. Then you hit them with the hard one. Boom. <laughs> so that's a strategy. I don't use it, but... <laughs> <laughs> I just do it because uh, it's my false ego, but anyway. <laughs> but it works. There's one devotee who was te teaching that, that process of how to use humor to get people's attention. And then as soon as you get that attention, then the next line you say is the, the ultimate line of surrender. <laughs> then everyone's open. <laughs> so, you know... He, he, Prabhupada said you have to somehow spread Krishna consciousness. <laughs> and because nobody wants it, you have to use some tricks sometimes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So you can try some of these things and see what works. But you know how you know how you can do it? Oh, I can tell you how you'll be successful. You just walk up to people, you hand them a book, and you just sit there and smile. You don't say anything. <laughs> and you just smile at them and hand them the book. And then after a while, you'll say something. But don't say anything at first. Just give them the book and have a biggest smile like, this is the happiest moment of my life because I met you. <laughs> and you can do it. You have that personality. You like to smile anyway. So you you smile at them, and this big guy is smiling at me. It must be something important here. <laughs> It'll work. You know, you'll distribute a lot of books. 
But if you spe start speaking, when you first give them the book, you'll ruin the whole thing. <laughs> I will take a note. Yeah, it'll work. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> okay. Chili Prabhupad Ki Jai.